14. Lord's Day 18. How dost thou understand these words? He ascended into heaven. That Christ, in sight of his disciples, was taken up from earth into heaven, and that he continues there for our interest until he comes again to judge the quick and the dead. Is not Christ then with us even to the end of the world as he hath promised? Christ is very man and very God. With respect to his human nature, he is no more on earth. But with respect to his Godhead, majesty, grace, and spirit, he is at no time absent from us. But if his human nature is not present wherever his Godhead is, are not then these two natures in Christ separated from one another? Not at all. For since the Godhead is illimitable and omnipresent, it must necessarily follow that the same is beyond the limits of the human nature he assumed, and yet is nevertheless in this human nature and remains personally united to it. Of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension into heaven? First, that he is our advocate in the presence of his Father in heaven. <clears throat> Secondly, that we have our flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that he, as the head, will also take up to himself us, his members. Thirdly, that he sends us his Spirit as an earnest, by whose power we seek the things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God not things on earth. Tonight we're especially going to ask and answer this question, why did our Savior ascend into heaven? Why was it necessary? And one answer to this is that Christ's ascension was prophesied in the Old Testament. Earlier we sang Psalm 7, 68. And I read to you verses 18 and 19 of Psalm 68. Thou, and it's a reference to Christ as Ephesians 4 makes plain, thou hast ascended on high, as high as heaven. Thou hast led captivity captive, that is, Christ has won a great victory and taken captive the devil and his demons. Thou hast received gifts for men, the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit. Yea, for the rebellious also, referring to the natural depravity of the elect, that, with this goal, this ascension, this defeat of Satan, these gifts for us, with this goal, that through it all, the Lord God might dwell among them as our covenant friend. So, verse 19 continues, Blessed be the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who daily loadeth us with benefits, the gifts and blessings he obtained from his cross, even the God of our salvation. Psalm 47, another psalm we sang a while ago, also prophesies Christ's ascension. Psalm 47, verse 5, God is gone up with a shout, God went up with a shout as personally joined to Jesus Christ. God is gone up, God ascended with a shout, the shout of victory and triumph. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. And then the call to worship, to worship God because of the ascension of Jesus. Sing praises to God. 
Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King. Sing praises. Four times we're commanded to sing praises because of the ascension of Jesus Christ. For God is the King of all the earth. That's especially evident that the ascension of Christ to God's right hand in heaven. <coughs> sing ye praises with understanding. Think about these things. Grasp this as you worship. God reigneth over the heathen because Christ ascended up into heaven. God is the king of all the earth. God sitteth upon the throne of his <coughs> holiness. Christ's ascension was necessary because it was prophesied in the Old Testament. And there are other passages I could refer to such as Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord Jehovah said to my Lord, Christ, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The ascension of Christ is not directly spoken of here. But how did Christ come to be in heaven, seated at God's right hand? Well, after his earthly ministry, he ascended up into glory. And there are many such passages that we could refer to in this connection. So since the Old Testament prophesied it, Christ must ascend into heaven. We can also refer to the New Testament, to the words of Jesus Christ himself, because he predicted his ascension during his earthly ministry. He did this especially according to his sayings in the Gospel according to John. And in the passages from John 14 and John 16, which we read earlier. So since we could argue Jesus Christ predicted that he would ascend, <coughs> it must necessarily happen. The necessity of Christ's ascension, though, goes further back. It happened not merely because the Old Testament prophesied it and Jesus Christ predicted it, but also because the triune God had already decreed it. It was determined in Jehovah's counsel before the world was, and that was why the prophets and the Psalms and the Lord Jesus himself could predict it because they knew that God had eternally purposed it. It must therefore take place because God worketh all things, including obviously Christ's ascension, after the counsel of his own will, as Ephesians 1 verse 11 says. At this point someone could say, well, everything that is decreed by God must necessarily happen. The answer to that, of course, is yes, that's true. And so we've got to sharpen our question. Why was it necessary for our salvation that Jesus ascend into heaven? Why was his ascension not a hindrance to our salvation? Why was it to our blessed advantage? This is always an issue in the church, right from the very beginning. The disciples in John 14 through 16 struggled with this very issue. They thought, why is Jesus talking about going away? Surely it would be better if he were to stay with us. How could it possibly help if he leaves us right now. And believers today are tempted to think the same way. And maybe you have even wondered, why did Jesus have to go? Surely it would be better if he stayed on earth. Maybe some of you even wonder this right now. Our catechism also addresses this issue in Lord's Day 18, which we read earlier. Question 49 is, 
Of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension into heaven? Why did he have to go to heaven? How did this help us? How does this help us? And as we consider this together, we should also ask this question. How does this help us to prepare for the Lord's Supper next Sunday morning? Let's consider then the necessity of Christ's ascension, the necessity of Christ's ascension, making two main points. First, his earthly work was finished, and therefore he must need to say. And second, his heavenly work had to begin, and therefore he needed to ascend. The necessity of Christ's ascension, his earthly work was finished, and his heavenly work had to begin. And I think it's helpful here to think of our Lord's earthly ministry in terms of his exercise of his prophetic office. You'll have to follow my reasoning a while before you'll see where we're getting, but I hope you can hang in there. As a prophet, by the end of his ministry, Jesus Christ had preached in all the places he was supposed to preach. He preached all around Galilee and its synagogues. He was very diligent in this because he knew this was the Father's will concerning him. He said on one occasion to his disciples, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. Mark 1 verse 38. And so the Lord engaged in exhaustive, itinerant preaching, returning periodically to his own house in Capernaum. He did this for three years to cover the ground, his Galilean ministry. Christ also preached in Jerusalem. And now we're not talking about a region, but a city, a capital city, where the temple was to the south of Galilee. He preached especially, but not exclusively, in Jerusalem at the three great pilgrimage feasts where all the Jewish men resorted. And so he didn't need to go into the outlying towns of Judea because if you preach in Jerusalem where the men folk are at those three great feasts, you're reaching them. Then they go back to their own villages. And so we read very little of Christ's work in Judea outside of Jerusalem. But someone might ask, couldn't Jesus have preached elsewhere if he had lived longer and stayed on earth longer? Surely it would have been better if instead of Paul going to what we call Turkey and Greece and Rome, surely it would have been better if Christ himself had been allowed a longer period of time so that he could have gone and brought the gospel to those places. Given a few years, perhaps he could have gone way to the east to India, or to the south into Africa. <coughs> now we need to see Christ's role in the history of redemption. What did he say? I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, verse 24. You may be thinking of one or some of the few exceptions to this, but these exceptions only prove the rule. There was the Syro-Phoenician woman, Syro from Syria and Phoenicia from that coastal strip in the north of Palestine, the Syro-Phoenician woman whom Christ met in the region of Tyre and Sidon to the north of Galilee. 
You remember that her daughter was grievously afflicted because she was possessed by a demon. Christ healed this woman's daughter as a sign of the future spread of the gospel to the Gentiles. And it was precisely in this connection that he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the general rule and principle. You may also recall the Lord's foray into Gentile territory and into Caesarea Philippi. It was there, of course, that Peter made his famous confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Whereupon Jesus proclaimed, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The idea is here that Jesus deliberately left Galilee and went on Gentile soil and asked, Who do men say that I am? To bring forth Peter's confession, to talk about his sovereign work of building the church. He did this because he wanted his promise of building the largely Gentile church, he wanted that promise to be made on Gentile soil. And you may remember a third instance, the woman at the well in Samaria. How come Jesus was there? Well, he was going between the two great preaching fields, Jerusalem in the south and Galilee in the north. And his converting this woman, who then witnessed to the menfolk of that time, others was a preparation for the gospel's later work because Jesus told them that they would go out preaching the gospel in Jerusalem, the capital city, to Judea, to the region in which that capital city was placed, to Samaria, and so to the uttermost parts of the earth. And if you recall, Christ's few years in Egypt, you think, well, surely that's a contradiction. It isn't. Because when Christ was in Egypt, he was a child, a little boy. He didn't preach in Egypt. He was only there in order to avoid the murderous hands of Herod the Great, because his parents warned by God through an angel to flee. And so that God in turn could call his son out of Egypt. <clears throat> Someone might say at this point though, but couldn't Christ have spent more time preaching to the Jews in the promised land? Saying in effect, I take your point, he isn't meant to go and into the pagan regions round about. But surely he could have stayed longer in the promised land. Surely that would have helped forward the work. But that isn't so either. Because the time of Christ's public ministry, <coughs> some three years, given his arduous preaching schedule and labors, the time of his public ministry was enough. It was enough to reveal the Father's will to the Jews. It was enough not merely to reveal the Father's will, but to reveal the Father to the Jews. Because Jesus said, and we read, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Because he is the Son who came to execute, interpret, represent, and portray God. So we have Christ's own words in his high priestly prayer in John 17. The hour has come. John 17 verse 6. 
I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. <clears throat> now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. To this we could add that after the Lord's three years of public ministry, the religious leaders and the majority of the people were hardened against him. In fact, you may recall instances in our Lord's earlier ministry where he had to be discreet or the people would have killed him early, so to speak. Jesus knew he had an hour, a time when he would die. So there were times, like in John 7, when he avoided public appearances. Then there were other times when they sought to seize him and kill him and God wrought a miracle so that Jesus could walk right through a hostile crowd, right through their midst, and they couldn't touch him. His hour was not yet come. God's will was for Christ to work among the Jews in his preaching and to teach them the will of the Father whom he was to reveal to them, and then it's finished. And having gone to all the places to which he was sent, and spent sufficient time <coughs> teaching them, his earthly prophetic ministry was finished. There was no more for him to do. Nowhere he needed to go, nothing else he needed to say. Therefore, it was time for him to ascend into heaven. We can also think of our Lord's earthly public ministry in terms of his kingly office. We can be quicker here because I think you're getting the idea. It is especially as a king, though also as a prophet, but we're emphasizing the kingly aspect, it's especially as a king that he proclaimed the kingdom of God. And the Jewish nation was given enough time to reject it, as most of the Jewish people did. Christ proclaimed, too, that many Gentiles would come from the north and the south east and the west to sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The king too trained his ambassadors, the apostles. He wanted twelve to be with him. He took these twelve with him on his preaching tours to equip them for their future ministry. He even gave them personal, practical experience of preaching when he sent them out two by two to preach the kingdom and to work miracles as signs that the kingdom of heaven was nigh. It was also as king that Jesus Christ gave the model prayer. How does it begin? Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. How does it end? For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. This is Jesus in his public ministry on earth as king. He spoke about, and he committed to the church, the keys of this kingdom. The preaching of the gospel. Matthew 16, and church discipline, Matthew 18. <coughs> Christ gave to the church also the two Christian sacraments during his earthly ministry. Baptism. Jesus 
with the twelve, baptized. We read of it in John 3 and John 4. We have occasionally <coughs> remarked upon this in the series of John the Baptist. And at his great commission, he told them to go out into all the world and preach the gospel and to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the other sacrament, the Lord's Supper, the one we're especially interested in tonight and next Sunday, the Lord's Supper was instituted on the very night on which he was betrayed. Continuing this idea of the Lord's kingly office, you will remember that it was as a king, Israel's true king, that Jesus Christ was crucified with this superscription on his cross in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And so just as the earthly phase of Christ's prophetic work was finished, no more to go, nothing more to say in that phase of his ministry, so the earthly phase of his kingly office was finished. His work as king would continue, but the earthly phase of it, it was done. And so it was time for him, he needs must, ascend into heaven to continue the work, to bring it to a higher stage and level. And we can be even briefer now as we turn to Christ's priestly work during his public ministry on earth. And here we home in straight away on the cross when he offered himself up as a sacrifice to God instead of us and for our sins. You remember the key word on the cross in this connection. It is finished. Quoted in our Lord's Supper form too. It is finished. The atonement is finished. My mortal life <coughs> work on earth is finished. To quote the Lord's high priestly prayer again, this time in John 17, verse 4, Christ said, near the start, I have glorified thee on the earth. How is that? I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. It's finished. The work on earth, the work as prophet, priest, and king on earth is finished. And so he must ascend into heaven to continue his prophetic, priestly, and kingly work there. That's the necessity of Christ's ascension. Now in general, Jesus Christ's ascension into heaven means that his exercise of that prophetic, priestly, kingly office is more obviously than ever before heavenly. Think, his public ministry, he's on earth, going around preaching, doing some priestly work, announcing the kingdom of heaven, then he's taken up into heaven and it's very obvious when he continues this prophetic, priestly, kingly work that his work is heaven. It's not earthly anymore. It's very obvious now that he is in heaven that his threefold office is universal. that he's no longer merely working with the Jews. It's very obvious too that when he's taken up into heaven, and heaven is above the whole earth, and heaven is glorious. When 
Jesus was on earth, his ministry was one of humiliation and suffering, but now that he's in heaven, above this world, in the realm of glory, his threefold office is much more glorious and much more obviously glorious than before. And then too, since he's the man who was taken up into heaven, it's very obvious that his work is divine and that he is divine, that he personally is the Son of God. While he was on earth, his deity was veiled. He looked like any other man walking down the street. And when he was on the cross, he was as a worm and no man. But in that he is taken up into heaven and he ascended, he's God. And if you take it with each of those offices individually, now he's not just a prophet. Through his ascension, he is a heavenly prophet. He speaks from heaven. He speaks from heaven to the whole world through the scriptures and the preaching of the gospel. He's not some itinerant preacher anymore. He's at the right hand of God. You can't just despise what he says and say, well, that's some public speaker, a guy who preaches a bit. If you could get away with that, which you couldn't during his life, but now he speaks from heaven as a divine prophet. And as the heavenly priest, Jesus Christ ministers in a far more glorious temple than Zedah or any priest in the Old Testament. He ministers, in the book of Hebrews especially makes this clear, in a heavenly tabernacle. Not just some tent in the Old Testament or some stone <coughs> building in Jerusalem. Heavenly tabernacle. And therefore, as a priest too, he intercedes at God's right hand, which is a lot more impressive, at least to the naked eye, <coughs> than seeing a man in a garden praying on his knees, as Christ did, for instance, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as the one who intercedes at God's right hand, he applies the redemption that he accomplished through his priestly work on earth. And now that Jesus has ascended, his claim to be king, which he did make on earth, his claim to be king comes with even greater power because he's a heavenly king. And he has a heavenly <coughs> kingdom, not merely an earthly kingdom, like the kingdom of Israel in the Old Testament, or the kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. A heavenly kingdom, a universal kingdom, not just a Jewish one, ruled by a glorious divine king, one who is very obviously not merely a man. And it's only Christ's ascension into heaven that can bring all of this about and that can make all of this an awful lot clearer than it ever was when Christ was on earth. A lot clearer than the disciples who were with Jesus for three years ever could have realized. And when they saw that man, Jesus, <coughs> go up in front of their very eyes in the Mount of Olives, and then when the Spirit was poured out a few weeks later, they began to see. A few days later, they began to see what this Jesus was all about. Who he was. The question and answer 49 at the very end of Lord's Day 18 very closely links Christ's ascension with heaven the place to which he ascended. Question 49 asks, 
of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension into heaven. And then three advantages are given. First, that he is our advocate in the presence of his Father in heaven. Secondly, that we have our flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that he is the head will also take up to himself us, his members. Thirdly, that he sends his spirit as an earnest by whose power we seek the things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God <coughs> not on things on earth. The only part that heaven is not mentioned is the thirdly but it talks about above at the right hand of God and not on earth. So the question is, of what advantage to us is Christ's ascension into heaven? And the first advantage spelled out in our catechism is the advantage of Christ's ascension into heaven <coughs> for us with regard to our sins. First, that he is our advocate in the presence of his Father in heaven. You know that the Lord's prayers were always answered. All of the prayers he made on earth. I know that thou hearest me always, he said in John 11. But it's even more obviously the case, and it's even easier for us to understand, that now that he is in the presence of God in heaven, every prayer will be answered. <coughs> and it's easier to see too, because Jesus is interceding at the right hand of God on the basis of the sacrifice he offered for our sins while he was on earth. Of what advantage is the ascension of Christ into heaven? He's our advocate, and we need an advocate because of our sins. He's our advocate in the presence of his Father in heaven. And here is comfort for the Christian because of Christ's ascension. Secondly, the advantage of Christ's ascension into heaven concerns our next life. Secondly, that we have our flesh in heaven as a sure pledge that he as the head will also take up to himself us, his members. And since Jesus, body and soul, glorified in both body and soul, is in heaven, he is there in a human body, human soul glorified, then we at death will go to be with Christ, we in our souls. Hard to believe that. It's easier to believe it with Jesus, a glorified man, already in heaven with regards to his soul. That helps us. And that the second coming of Jesus Christ, which will lead to the resurrection of the dead, we as to our bodies will be raised from the grave to meet him in the air, as Thessalonians especially explains. And this is our hope. Hope after death and hope with regard to our bodies at the return of Christ. There is an advantage here spelled out in question and answer 49 with regard to our meditations. Thirdly, that he sends us his spirit as an earnest by whose power we seek the things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God and not things on earth. Through the ascension of Jesus Christ bodily into heaven, we have the object 
of our longing up there. Christ sits at God's right hand. Difficult enough to set our mind and affection on things above, but if we know that Jesus Christ is there, and He is our life and our Savior, the Christian is helped. And since Jesus ascended up into heaven, He isn't only the object of our longing, He gives us the Spirit that comes down from heaven so that our faith is empowered to think about these things. Because it's only the Spirit that seeks the glory of Jesus Christ. And therefore it's only the Spirit who enables us to think about the world to come. And so Christ's objective bodily ascension is the model, the incentive, and encouragement for our ascension in different ways and senses. Now as I've said, question and answer 49 refers to heaven three times because everything is up in this part of Lord's Day 18. Heaven three times, not on earth once, above once, and up is once. So the ascension says the Christian's orientation and direction is up. That's the lesson of Christ's ascension. Our prayers must go up because we have an advocate in the presence of our Father in heaven. We in our souls must go up at death because Jesus, as to his soul, is in heaven. We in our bodies will go up to meet Christ in the air at his second coming. Because he, as to his body, is in heaven. And even our affections must go up. He sends us his spirit as an earnest by whose power we seek the things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God and not things on earth. And this too is that to which the Lord's Supper stirs us up. Just before we partake of the bread and the wine in our Lord's Supper form. And this is deeply rooted in the Christian and Reformed tradition. Exhorts us to lift up our hearts on high in heaven where Christ Jesus is our advocate at the right hand of his heavenly Father whither all the articles of our faith lead us. And it explains that part of the form. That this is the way to be fed and refreshed in our souls with the true heavenly bread, Jesus Christ.